بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد The third cause of istighfar which we'll take today is الذنوب الوجودية الظاهرة Apparent existential sins In that term that he titled it Sheikh Nasser titled it under الذنوب الوجودية Ibn Taymiyyah used that term, and that's where he got it from. Uh, he used it under the tafsir of ma asabaka min hasanatin fa min Allah. He said, Ibn Taymiyyah said, innama yubtala bihi al-abd min al-dhunub al-wujudiyya wa in kanat khalqan lillah fahuwa uqubatun lahu ala adami fi'lihi ma khalaqahu Allahu lahu wa fatarahu alayhi. When one is tested with these existential sins, even though they are a creation from Allah. They are a punishment for those who don't do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created them to do and what he instilled them on. This cause is the most popular cause of istighfar and almost everyone knows it. And when istighfar and tawbah are mentioned, they're generally talking about this cause right here. The author said many limit istighfar to this one particular cause due to their ignorance of the other causes, even though they need istighfar for the other causes just as much, if not more. These are the super clear sins where you find even the fussa who fall into such sins and they're persistent on them sometimes. They know they did wrong. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides them, they know to seek tawbah and istighfar from those sins like killing, zina, stealing, transgression on others. Sins of the tongues like namima, tattletaling, making enmity, enmity between friends and brothers and sisters or Muslims, obscenity in talking, backbiting, lying. الذنوب الوجودية الظاهرة الظاهرة, they're clear, they're apparent. In the Sheikh also, that's, that's what he titled it under, but he also referred to it as المحرمات الظاهرة. He called this cause al dhunub al wujudiyyatu al-zahira, then he referred to it as al muharramatu al-zahira, and even that term is taken from Ibn Taymiyyah as well. Rahimahullah. Uh, when you read and live with someone's work so much and you study it and analyze it, you, de you develop his style and terminology without even perceiving it sometimes. The context in what Ibn Taymiyyah used, al muharramatu al-zahira, sheds a little bit more light on the clarity of these types of sins. He was basically saying that they're clear and known successively and that anyone who denies them as being haram is a kafir without a dispute. He said, إِنَّ الْإِيمَانَ بِوُجُوبِ الْوَاجِبَاتِ الظَّاهِرَةِ الْمُتَوَاتِرَةِ وَتَحْرِيمِ الْمُحَرَّمَاتِ الظَّاهِرَةِ الْمُتَوَاتِرَةِ هُوَ مِنْ أَعْظَمِ أُصُولِ الْإِيمَانِ وَقَوَاعِدِ الدِّينِ وَالْجَاحِدُ لَهَا كَافِرٌ بِالْتِفَاقِ Believing that the clear, apparent, successive prohibitions are prohibited is among the biggest principles of Iman and the rules of this deen and one who denies them as being haram is a kafir without a dispute. He's saying those uh, who claim, for example, stealing, clear sin, is not haram. He's a kafir, without a dispute. Now, having used that quote of Ibn Taymiyyah, I must clarify that statement so it will not be misconstrued as it has been. Uh, I've read it being misconstrued before. Uh, some take statements and use them broad and out of their context and combine them with other quotes of ulama and apply them randomly. Uh, without knowing uh, other meanings of these statements. Some in Arabic and some in English. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed someone with a talent of translating and some knowledge, it's important to know the limits. And I stress that many times over the years. That's not to discourage from da'wah. We desperately need dua on the haqq, but we need dua who know that ayah, that hadith, that principle of tawheed and shirk, that haram and halal that they're trying to convey. Some get too loose with the PDFs in their platform and speak on dangerous matters. Matters that you need to study, really study, study, not read, 30 to 40 volumes. And that's after studying the foundational knowledge is under shiuch and studying that matter itself under some shiuch of haqq as well. Before coming to personal conclusions, 
if one fears Allah. What are you going to do يوم القيامة? قل أرأيتم ما أنزل الله لكم من رزق فجعلتم منه حراما وحلالا قل آه الله أذن لكم آه الله أذن لكم أم على الله تفترون وما ظن الذين يفترون على الله الكذب يوم القيامة You make some matters lawful and unlawful آه الله أذن لكم Did Allah give you permission and authorization or are you fabricating lies against Allah? That's in matters of haram and halal. So imagine matters of usul al-deen. That's not to discourage anyone. I, I repeat that from da'wah. The people are thirsty for the haqq. And there's a drought. But at the same time, one needs to know his limits and ability, especially in principle matters, so that they will not fall into error and misguide or be among the ones who said Allah mentioned in the super major sins وَأَن تَقُولُوا عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Abd al-Rahman ibn Abi Layla said I met 120 of the Sahaba each being asked about an issue then he refers it to the next and the next until it goes back to the first Ahmad ibn Muhammad al-Iskafi al-Athram al-Ta'i who was a student of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal he said I would repeatedly hear Imam Ahmad saying I don't know in matters that I know he knows his, the, the opinions in them. Ibn Abbas and Ibn Mas'ud said, anyone who answers every fatwa that's presented to him is crazy. The quote of Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah that I mentioned is saying one who denies an apparent successive prohibition, a haram, as being a haram is kafir. That's where? That's in the 12th volume. In the seventh volume, he said, the one who denies the prohibition of the clear apparent haram after, look at that, after proof was established against him, then he's a kafir. That essential addition to what's in the 12th volume is significant. He said, on top of what's in the 12th volume, he said, those where proof has not been established against them, like the ones new into Islam or those who live in towns far where the Sharia didn't reach to them or someone who uh, made uh, an error thinking the people who believe and do good deeds are exempt from the prohibition of drinking alcohol like what happened during Umar radiallahu anh's time when he asked them to recant after he summoned them. Those and anyone like them, you ask them to repent and recant if they insist they are disbelievers. If they insist, they are disbelievers. And they are kuffar. And you don't rule that they are kuffar before that. The Sahaba didn't consider Qudama and his companions kuffar in their misunderstanding. And I'll get to that in a second. So in the 12th volume, there's no mention of excuse in such matters because it's summarized. Whereas in the seventh volume, he went into detail and mentioned the possibility of excuse due to ignorance in such matters. Authors sometimes give a conclusion, sometimes they elaborate. The elaboration defines the summary. And sometimes what creates confusion is the fatwa is given based on a certain circumstance. And there's other reasons. So what Ibn Taymiyyah was talking about, he was talking about Qudama ibn Mab'un, who was a maternal uncle of Abdullah ibn Umar. He witnessed Badr and he was a governor of Umar radiallahu an in Bahrain. Qudama radiallahu an didn't believe alcohol was fully halal. But he believed that there's an exemption for those who do righteous good deeds based on the general terms of the ayah. لَيْسَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ جُنَاهُمْ فِي مَا طَعِمُوا إِذَا مَتَّقَوْا وَآمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ ثُمَّ اتَّقَوْا وَآمَنُوا ثُمَّ اتَّقَوْا وَأَحْسَنُوا وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ In Surah Al-Ma'idah, in summary, the meaning of the verse, those who believe and do righteous good deeds, there's no sin on them for what they consume, if they fear Allah. Imam Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab, rahimahullah, said, it's by ijma' of the Sahaba, during the time of Umar, that they do takfir on Qudama and those with him, if they didn't repent. That's a statement used against Imam Muhammad uh, a lot. And they use it against him to claim that he declared takfir on a sahabi. But they don't say that he said, if they don't repent. 
if they don't repent. Qudama's ta'wil was clearly an innocent error in ta'wil, misinterpretation. Because as soon as the matter was explained to them, they repented from that misrepresentation. That verse was actually revealed pertaining to Khamra as well. It's not some random verse he pulled out and used it. It actually, the reason for revelation pertained to Khamra as well. In Musnad, uh, in Musnad Ahmad, Ibn Abbas said, the companions asked after Khamra was prohibited, oh messenger, what? What about those who died consuming alcohol? What's the status of those who died using alcohol before it was prohibited? They drank and they died drinking, never repented. Now it's prohibited. What's their status? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse. Of course, the verse is an exemption for those who died consuming it before it was prohibited. Those who believe and do righteous good deeds, there is no sin on them for what they consumed. But his error, his error was in the ta'wil, misinterpretation to include those alive as well. Point being, there may be an excuse and ignorance in those matters based on certain times, certain eras, era could be a factor, uh, certain situations, certain individuals, Factors that may weigh, weigh in to give an excuse. Like the example Ibn Taymiyyah gave, which I mentioned, a person who lives far away where Sharia didn't reach him, and he can't reach anywhere. Or he got caught up in Dar al-Kufr, he took his Shahada, there's no knowledgeable people or Muslims there, and he's ignorant of some matters of halal, haram and halal. Ignorance that can be removed by learning is not an excuse for falling into haram or leaving an ordain. Ignorance where one sincerely wants to remove it with all that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him, but he can't. Ignorance where one can't remove it because the channels and avenues to the truth or the knowledge is not possible. So we took how to combine what Ibn Taymiyyah said in volume seven and in volume 12. And if I stop here, it's going to be misconstrued even more. So my final point is what I said so far, we're talking about haram and halal. I didn't mention tawheed, did I? Nor did Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Haram and halal, al-wajibat al-zahira, al-mutawatira, al-muharramat al-zahira, asl al-milla, the main clear principle matters of Tawheed and major shirk, they're on a different level. There's no excuse in that. We explained that aspect in an entire halaqa before and how to understand the proofs and consolidate between the statements of the ulama that may confuse as to how they pertain to ahkam al-dunya, matters of the dunya, and ahkam al-akhirah, the matters of the akhirah, as Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah specified. He was one of those who specified that. We gave a lengthy halaq on that in the past. Did you publish it? Did you upload it? If it's not available, schedule a time, we can do another halaqa inshallah on that topic or probably better yet a book so the references can be specified by pages and volumes. Finally, uh, this cause of istighfar is the clearest, most popular one. Clear, apparent sins, that's, it. that's the title of it. So nearly everyone knows it. Everyone knows zina, killing, backbiting, transgression uh, is haram. And it's the most popular one, so we'll leave it at that. And we can start the next one since this was a, a short cause. 
probably after Salah because the Salah comes in uh, sooner these days. Jazakumullah khair and after Salah we'll take the next one. It's short as well.